Welcome everyone to the book launch event of Professor Mariana Valverde's book, Infrastructure, which has just come out with Routledge this month as part of the New Trajectories in Law series. I want to welcome Professor Valverde, who's here with us today, as well as Professor uh, Patricia Wood, who is a professor in geography at uh, York University, and Professor Sergio Montero, who's a professor at Universidad de Los Santos. Uh, professor Patricia Wood and Sergio Montero would be the discussants uh, today. Uh, my name is Luisa Sotomayor and I'm an associate professor in urban planning in the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change at York University in Toronto. I'm also a colleague for the CV's research cluster at the Robert Center for Canadian Studies at York University, which is hosting today's event. The event is also co-sponsored by uh, the City Institute at York University, and I'm really honored uh, to be the chair for this event today. I would like to start with a land acknowledgement from the ter territory where we are hosting uh, this event today, knowing that uh, you're probably in, in many different locations, but uh, I'm going to uh, use the land acknowledgement uh, for the city of Toronto. Takaronto is on the dish with one spoon territory among other treaties. The dish with one spoon is a wampum between the Anishinaabeg, the, Hani the Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent indigenous nations and peoples, Europe Europeans and all newcomers, have been invited to the, into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. As we consider the tenets of the dish with one spoon in our current time, we must be mindful of the struggles that face indigenous people, not, not only across Canada, but uh, across the Americas and all over the world. These struggles remind us of our own duty to protect the land, uh, preserve and be grateful for this land on which we live and work. We have equal responsibility as caretakers of the land and we recognize the need to live in ways that reflect the treaties agreed to before our time. Okay, so the event today is virtually hosted by the CV's research cluster at the Robert Center for Canadian Studies and co-sponsored by the City Institute at York University. Uh, and we want to extend a warm welcome to everyone. Uh, just to let you know a bit about what the CV's research cluster is. Uh, it is a research center or cluster that brings together scholars, members of the community who are actively engaged in the consideration of organ governance in Canada and globally. The work of the cluster is concerned with the ways in which we build cities today, especially as we face new or newish challenges such as new technologies, mitigating and adapting to climate change, and now recovering from the pandemic in the current moment. Uh, also, all the processes of decision making that go into that city building by multiple levels of government and by the public. Questions such as who will make the decisions and how those decisions are made are equally important questions. And we see urban citizenship concerns uh, about a fundamental question of who constitutes the city. We approach infrastructure, the topic of, um, of interest today uh, in this book launch as part of the city fabric, not just a backdrop or the backstage of a city. Uh, in this cluster, we organize public events and informal gatherings of scholars as well as contributing to or supporting several research projects. Okay, so the event today is organized as follows. First, we'll hear Professor Mariana Valverde's presentation, followed by comments by our discussants today, Professor Patricia Wood and Sergio Montero. Our discussants will be followed by a Q&A session. It is now my absolute honor to introduce Professor Mariana Valverde to deliver her presentation. Mariana Valverde is Professor Emerita at the Center for Criminology and Social Legal Studies at the University of Toronto and a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada since 2006. Professor Valverde's main research interests are urban law and governance, historically and in the present, and in the at the theoretical level, Foucault, sexuality studies, theories of spatial temporality, and actor network theory. Professor Valverde is the author of six sole authored books, six co-edited collections, about 50 refereed journal art articles and various research reports and popular publications, and has twice won the Law and Society Association's Jacob Award, its main book prize. 
More recently, one of Mariana's students asked me, how did you meet Mariana? And in all honesty, my answer was, who doesn't know Mariana? Everyone knows Mariana. And indeed, she's, she has and beyond uh, her, all of uh, her, her uh, stellar career as an academic, she's also um, a, a professor and a mentor to so many generations of uh, researchers and academic all over the world, and that reflects in the uh, yeah in the in the very global audience that we have for this event today. For us at York, it's also such an honor to have Professor Mariana Alverde back. She was a student at York University and also a professor uh, until 1993. We had initially planned to have this event in person, and we thought about taking the new piece of infrastructure to York, which is the subway line that now comes to York University. Uh, and unfortunately, we were not able to do it, but we're very glad that uh, we had the chance to host this event for a, for a global audience as we have today. So without further ado, now over to you, Mariana. Thank you so much uh, to Luisa and Trisha and Sergio, but also to the City Institute and the Robert Center at York. It's a pleasure to uh, have this event. And um, speaking of the global audience that maybe the Institute wants to have, but also that the book will hopefully have, I managed after many, after publishing many books with Routledge, to ensure that the rights to translate the book into Spanish were reserved to me in the contract, because if you don't do it at the time of the contract, that's it. And so I'm pleased to say that there's a wonderful Chilean social legal scholar who's just finished her, her PhD at the Université de Montréal, who will be translating it into Spanish, and she's already arranged for a publisher in Chile. The title that I wanted for the book was infrastructure, a keyword for our time. And there may be people in the audience who are old enough to have read, um, you know, Raymond Williams famous book on keywords. And so there's a sort of spirit of Raymond Williams here. But of course, the topic is infrastructure. And the picture that I open with is the Hoover Dam in the US, uh, which was one of the biggest infrastructure projects of its time. And this picture is recent, so it shows the low level of the Colorado River. Um, and you'll see another picture of the Hoover Dam a bit later. Um, and Anyway, so why is it a keyword of our time? Well, it's a keyword for our time for two reasons, I think. First, the word, like other keywords such as culture, civilization, freedom, democracy, and so on, has a lot of flexibility in its meaning. So it can be used by both the left wing and the right wing. So the left wing in recent years has tried to justify social spending by calling it social infrastructure. Um, on the other hand, Joe Biden was only able to pass his first infrastructure bill through Congress because the Republicans agreed to fund what is called hard infrastructure, which is, of course, mostly highways and bridges and things that serve the purpose for drivers. Um, um, and so because of the flexibility of meaning, it has a wide flexibility of political uses. And I think somebody who's, who's a cultural studies person could do a nice study on why is it that white male politicians love to be photographed wearing hard hats when they never wear hard hats in their regular life. Um, anyway, I'll leave you with those pictures and you can uh, do your own analysis or commentary of the hard hat fashion um, 
at least among male politicians, there's very few pictures of female politicians wearing hard hats. I did find one of Angela Merkel, but that's it. Anyway, um, the feminist cultural studies people would have a lot to say about that. Now, what is the origin of the term infrastructure? Um, the term was invented in the late 19th century by French engineers and then adopted into, into English, but it sort of didn't have any real currency until the last 10 or 15 years. But in its, in its original meaning, what the French engineers meant was literally what was underneath these structures that they were building, especially the railways, because it was generally a consensus that the government needed to do the prior work before the privately owned railways could be built. What was the prior work? Well, first of all, expropriation of land, which usually only governments can do, not you know, private corporations. So the government had to expropriate land. And in many cases, the government committed itself to spending money, literally leveling the terrain so that the private um, you know, companies could build their um, you know, railways on top. And you can see that there is a sort of implicit theory of public-private partnerships at work in this original meaning of the word infrastructure. Now, there were other possible public-private partnerships that might have been helpful, but didn't happen. One that didn't happen was what could have happened in the UK if the massive level of unemployment uh, in Victorian England had been mobilized to generate labor for public works. But this would have broken with the sort of liberal theory of the state that was current at the time. So instead of getting long-term unemployed men to do pu public works, which is what happened in the depression, in Victorian times, what happened is that these men were said to do perfectly useless work, like breaking stones that nobody was gonna use for anything or being on the treadmill in workhouses and, and, and prisons. So this was a public-private partnership that you know, could have generated infrastructure, but didn't until much later. So much later, we get the age of you know, publicly subsidized public works that both put people to work and create infrastructure. So that's the top black and white picture is a picture of the Hoover Dam when it was being built, which was one of President Roosevelt's um, key sort of projects. Um, the other dam is the biggest hydroelectric dam in the US, the Grand Coulee Dam, which is actually not very far south from Vancouver in Washington state. It's not nearly as famous, but it's bigger and more important. Um, so here we have the sort of, you know, representation of a new approach. And at that time, what was talked about was public works. Um, and of course, um, you know, President Roosevelt was the great sort of hero of public works on a grand scale as I'm sure um, you know, most of you know. So um, what were some of the other public works of the time? Well, in some parts of the world, public housing was a huge project that both employed a lot of people, but also housed a lot of people. Um, the nice picture on the top left is a rather seedy and unpleasant public housing project in London, but it's a nice photograph, so I'm using it. And the other two pictures on the bottom are the public housing that was built, not only in New York, but in Manhattan, in what was actually quite valuable land, uh, which 
is a whole story about where public housing was built because in England, it was usually built in not valuable land outside of the city center. Uh, and of course in England, they didn't have the massive urban renewal projects that they had in the, in the US. But it wasn't just public housing and things like the Hoover Dam and the Grand Coulee Dam. Um, the post-war period in particular saw a lot of other major infrastructure works. Um, you had the expansion of telephone service, which previously had been on a much smaller scale. And I mean, in, uh, in England, in cities, you had telephone service in the 1920s, but in many other places, like in the part of Spain where I grew up, we only got telephone service around 1960. Um, and it was the kind of phone, you know, where you had to call the operator and ask for a particular number. You know, some of you may remember that. Uh, so, you know, the telephone service was really important and it has to be done on a large scale. Uh, you know, telephone service is not something that can be done on a small scale like you have now with some Wi-Fi sort of networks that are actually tiny. And then of course, there were also water sort of projects, both sewers and drinking water. And those of you who are at York University or live around there may or may not know that without the infrastructure known as the big pipe, all the residential development in York region could not have taken place because there's not enough water in the Oak Ridges Moraine and fresh water had to be brought in from Lake Ontario. And the city of Toronto seems to have heavily subsidized the residential development in the 905 um, in York region in particular through this big pipe. And the picture at the bottom left is a picture of the building of the water filtration plant that still functions today. It's the um, Harris plant at the end of the Queen streetcar for those of you who are in Toronto. Um, anyway, I like that picture, so I put it in and also I frequent the, the uh, place because I live not far from there. Um, now, what started to happen? What brought about the decline of public works? Um, well, clearly the decline of public works is very linked to the decline of the welfare state, both in terms of ideals and values and in terms of actual major infrastructure projects. And I think most people are familiar with the critique of public works from the right, the sort of taxpayer revolution in the US and in Europe, of course, we had the sort of neoliberal re 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 revolution of Margaret Thatcher and others. But I think it's important to also note that big public works were not only criticized from the right as tax and spend, you know, sort of, sort of projects. They were also criticized from what I'm calling the sort of left, because I do not want to say that Jane Jacobs was actually on the left as we would recognize the left today, but she was the most important critic of major public works, both when she lived in Greenwich Village and fought against Robert Moses, and when she moved to Toronto and fought against the Spadina Expressway that was gonna go right through the annex where she lived. So she had a critique of major public works that was sort of vaguely progressive, although it wasn't really from the left because as many people have pointed out, she wasn't in the least critical of the white segregationist sort of character of the Greenwich Village that she eulogized in her work. Anyway, um, now on to what is the book about, I've managed to reduce most of the book to one slide and it's sort of text heavy, but bear with me. Um, I'm 
I decided that when writing this book, I wouldn't do a whole series of case studies. There's like hundreds of case studies of infrastructure projects, often from the point of view of why they failed or why they you know, turned out badly. But I didn't want to do case studies. What I wanted to do was in a Foucauldian sort of vein, pay attention to the techniques, the tools that are used to plan, visualize, justify, represent, and build infrastructure, what is called infrastructure now, and used to be called public works. Um, so there are certain features of the infrastructure enabling field, and most of these features are common to the global north and the, the uh, global south. At the municipal or smaller scale sort of level, there's a, there's a lot of differences between the global north and the south, but at the level of huge public works, uh, you know, a new harbor or a new train line or something, there's a lot fewer differences because the same actors are, are involved. So first of all, you don't just have ministries of infrastructure, which is one of the sort of changes from public works. We now have ministries of, of infrastructures as of 2003 in Canada, in Ontario, and you know, similar in other places. But more importantly, from the point of view of studying the state, um, we have specialized public agencies that have their own boards and are structured as corporations. So in the Toronto area, a lot of people are familiar with Metrolinks. It's the public agency we all love to hate for good reasons. But the point is not whether it does a good job or a bad job. The point is that it's set up as an arm's length agency, which is supposed to report in the case of Metrolinks to the Ministry of Transportation. But there's really no accountability even to the minister. So there's no ministerial ac accountability. And if you ask the minister of transportation a question about Metrolinx in the house, you'll be told, oh, you'll have to ask Metrolinx about that because she doesn't really know what goes on in, in, in Metrolinx. And you also have Infrastructure Ontario, which is hugely influential throughout the world as a model of transparency, believe it or not, uh, because other infrastructure agencies are even less transparent. Um, so the new public management, for those of you for whom that phrase has a meaning, is really important in the setting up of the infrastructure enabling field, the public part of it, in these standalone arm's length corporations instead of ministries with ministerial accountability in the sort of Westminster tra tradition. Um, you also have large construction firms and the point is that there's very few of them. So in Ontario, if you wanna do a big project, but Elliston and Acon are not interested, you're gonna be really hard up to actually make anything happen. There's also um, you know, transnational engineering firms. There's two huge ones in Spain that work all over the world, building toll highways and high-speed trains. Um, and there's also specialized firms. Bombardier in Canada used to make LRTs and uh, you know, subways and trains. It now has sold that business to Alstom, the French sort of giant. So now all the LRTs in the world were, are going to look the same, they used to you know, look the same. Like if you go to Vienna or you go to Amsterdam or if you go to Bilbao, the LRTs are the same. Well, they were all built by Bombardier once upon a time and now they're all gonna be built by Alstom. Anyway, so I think it's really important to draw attention to the fact that there's a few global firms that do really well in the infrastructure business. Um, and small local firms are usually sidelined. Now, banks used to be very important in funding any state project, but um, banks are now less important. And what is really important in financing these projects are specialized infrastructure funds and also pension funds. 
and pension funds, the, the, the pension funds that count are in the public sector where they're still really big. And Canada is particularly rich in rich public sector pension funds. Um, Ontario Teachers, the Caisse de Depot in Quebec, OMERS, the um, you know, Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, which as of December of 2021 had over 550 billion squirreled away in assets. Um, so that, that is almost the size of Google. It's not quite, but it's almost. So that kind of gives you a sense of these, um, uh, you know, pension funds and other infrastructure funds. And my friend Fleur Johns in Sydney has a phrase, financing as governance. And I really like that phrase because in fact, in my studies of different infrastructure projects, it seems like the most important factor in deciding whether a project is going to go ahead or be sort of put on the back burner for the next government is whether the project is bankable. And of course, it's at the scale of the single project that financing is done. Uh, and in general, that has had an impact of, on how we talk about infrastructure, because if you read the you know, pages of your local newspaper, you will see reports about particular infrastructure projects. But I would argue that that's the wrong scale in terms of democratic participation, because how many people know whether a new hospital should cost $200 million or $400 million? Well, we don't know that. And we can't really judge the project at the scale of the single project. What we could judge is whether the priorities are correct in general. And in Canada, we've had scandals about infrastructure that is sorely needed in indigenous communities not being um, you know, provided because it's not bankable. Um, anyway, so the scale of the single project is probably one of the worst features of infrastructure to, today. There is not a government I've been able to find that actually has an infrastructure plan that is multi-sector and multi, multi-regional. They only have projects, they don't have plans. And that is a, a huge difference. It's really important. Now, I just wanna quickly run through a bit of research that I did with some colleagues on Infrastructure Ontario, and it's typical of, of other infrastructure agencies. Um, so we were looking both at what we call the performance of transparency. How is it that Infrastructure Ontario got to have the reputation of being transparent? Well, a lot of it was because they claimed to post contracts online, like the actual project contracts. Uh, well, they're about 600 pages long and the financials are redacted. So they're basically useless, <laughs> you know, that's, that's one thing and anyway, but but there's a lot of other um, ways, there, there's a lot of other workarounds to the imposition of transparency rules and laws. And I know that's certainly a factor in Colombia and other places that have had sort of democratic constitutions or revolutions and have imposed all kinds of transparency rules. Those transparency rules can be gotten around quite easily, um, as it turns out. Anyway, the, the usual story about how public-private partnerships and private financing came to be is that there was a general sort of neoliberal sort of critique of the bureaucracy of you know, traditional public works procurement. And so the critique of the bureaucracy said, oh, well, you have to go through all these things, all this red tape, you know, we can't ever build anything. Um, and also the critique was also that there was no innovation because by the time it got through the red tape and, and, and the, 
the uh, bureaucracy, you know, all the schools, like all the high schools in Ontario that were built in the 60s look alike. And this is not the only place where that happens. So there was a very neoliberal interest in innovation. And so some new actors from the private sector tried to look for unique projects and they tried to be innovative and they tried to make choices at the one project at a time scale. But a Bay Street corporate lawyer that we interviewed who does a lot of these P3s said, well, the problem then was too few projects because if you're going to start from scratch and you know design every project to meet the local needs and so on, um, you're not gonna have enough projects and the finance people in particular are going to complain that there's not enough projects. So what happened is that in Infrastructure Ontario responded to the too few projects problem by developing what they called a template. And they didn't want to call the template red tape, but that is in fact what it was. It was the reinvention of red tape. And uh, a senior person in the construction industry in Ontario said at a workshop that I was able to sort of uh, be the fly on the wall for, that the template that Infrastructure Ontario has is now the size of War and Peace, well, meaning the novel, of, of course. And he also complained that I, Infrastructure Ontario with its War and Peace size, um, you know, templates started to micromanage the process and do precisely what they criticized the old, uh, you know, public works bureaucracy for having done. Anyway, um, the other thing was that in public works, it's very common to spread out costs over several fiscal years, but this is not suited to the private sector and the lenders. Um, so what you had in, in public-private partnerships and all the infrastructure Ontario projects of any size now are public-private partnerships. Um, what they have is very large initial budgets. So of course they can come in on budget because the budget is so huge. And because it's only given for the project, the average um, you know, citizen isn't able to you know, question it. But then also an insider told me that every infrastructure Ontario um, you know, contract is followed quickly by a post-contract contingency fee of 4%, which if you're talking about $400 million is, is a lot of money. Anyway, so now we don't want just, or the infrastructure enabling field in general is not interested in innovation and in unique projects. It's interested in what is universally called a pipeline of projects. And you'll find that very phrase in the Canada Infrastructure Bank, but also in Australia and other places. Now the phrase pipeline of projects is sort of interesting because it makes it seem that projects are as fungible as petroleum. And you know, whether it's a hospital or a prison or a school, who cares? It's, a, it's the pipeline of projects. Now who needs the pipeline of projects? It's the public sector infrastructure funds that need the pipeline of projects because they need to ensure income over a very long sort of period of time. Um, okay, so basically they've, in, they've reinvented the very bureaucracy that the whole sort of P3 thing was supposed to uh, end. Um, okay, so that's sort of, uh, you know, summary of my research on infrastructure Ontario. I'll be happy to talk more about it in the Q&A. And I just want to end with this slide, which shifts to um, the global, if you want to call it that, or rather it shifts to the global south because it's very striking that only infrastructure projects in the global south have to worry about the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank and the Asian Development Bank and all of these. And they have to get funding from there because their projects are often seen as not bankable. And the credit ratings of the governments in the global south are often much, much lower than what we're used to in Ontario. So they end up getting financing not from the 
via sort of private sector, but from these world banks or global banks. And the World Bank is currently promoting P3s, um, you know, public-private partnerships. And of course, because it's a UN agency, it can't tell people, it can't tell the countries that they have to use it. But it's interesting that the only advice that they give is on P3s. There is no other um, unit that advises countries that want to have innovation in public sector procurement and public funding. That just does not exist. So sort of by default, all these countries in the global south that have to get funding from the World Bank or the IMF or whatever are pushed into P3s. And the last picture on that slide simply um, you know, refers to one of the fashions in infrastructure, which is the smart city. So in the book, there's a chapter on smart cities, which uses a little bit of the research that I did some years ago on the Google city project in Toronto that never happened. But also I did quite a bit of research with some students in India on the government of India's 100 smart cities mission, which is the most awful thing that, I mean, just to cut to the chase, it's as bad as anything that the Indian government has done. Uh, but it's also very internally contradictory because it's, about, it's supposed to promote the financial autonomy of medium-sized cities in India, but it also forces them by law to work only with um, you know, global tech companies and, and global consultants who write their proposals. So anyway, if anybody's interested in that, that's recent research that is going to be published in two um, Indian law journals, but I'm happy to talk about if, if, if anyone here is interested in that. Okay, so I'll stop sharing my screen now and uh, I'm happy to hear, uh, you know, comments. And I think I've gone a little bit over time. No, actually, I haven't. Oh, I'm, I don't I'm two know. minutes under. <laughs> Yay, this is a first ever. Well, thank you so much, Mariana, for unpacking the black box of infra global infrastructure for us. Um, I will now like to introduce our first discussant for today, Professor uh, Patricia Wood. Dr. Patricia Wood is a colleague of the CV's research cluster that hosts the event today at the Robert Center and professor and graduate program director of geography at York University. She studies right, rights claims, activism, and governance, particularly the experience of marginalized communities. Her current projects include comparative international research on municipal and urban regional governance, and she's a member of the research team for Student MoveTO, a multi-stakeholder project on post-secondary students' transportation practices in the GTHA. She has written a transit and urban affairs column for several years, first with Toronto East and now for spacing.ca. She's a senior advisor for the transit advocacy organization Code Red TO and was also a member of the City of Toronto TTC Transit Review Expert Advisory Panel on the proposed upload of the subway. Uh, now over to you, Tricia. Thanks very much. Um... So the first thing I ever read by Mariana Valverde was her 1991 book, The Age of Light, Soap and Water, Moral Reform, 1885 to 1925. I was in graduate school doing a PhD in history, and it was on my list for my doctoral exams. Um, I considered myself a historian at the time, obviously, and I thought she was too, but she, of course, was so much more than that, is so much more than that, and went on to do a lot more work on as Louisa mentioned, sexuality and society, but also cities, city charters and local democracy, and also on the legal trickery of the crown and sovereignty. And so I've come to read her again and again. Um, and I think there's something in common between the first book I read and this most recent one on infrastructure, which I will come back to in a moment. 
So somewhere in the late middle of this book, uh, in the chapter on smart cities, Mariana quotes the geographer Rob Kitchen, who says that smart cities are not really a thing or a type of city, but, quote, a series of decisions about digitization and computing taken in an urban context. And I think this is a good way about, of thinking about cities and city form generally, too. Uh, and this is one of her points, that we recognize how law and governance build society, and specifically here, cities. And this implicates not just questions of public and private and which tech and why, but fundamental practices and institutions of democracy, specifically local democracy. When Mariana writes that deals are the unit of infrastructure at every level, she's talking about many things, one of which is how government by contract is shifting not just city building and public funds to the, public, to the private sphere, but another equally important thing is how these decisions are being moved away from democratic spaces of councils and public consultations. In other literature, these deals are often talked about as mega projects, which is a word I think Mariana uses once or twice in the book, but it, not, a, not a focus, that's not one of the words she takes up. But this is scholarship I would really like to see Mariana engage with directly, in part because I think it provides some theory that would interest her and a huge pile of case studies for her to work with, so she doesn't have to do them herself. Um, but I think there's, I, I think it's a mutual relationship as I want to elaborate. Um, so for those who aren't familiar, uh, mega projects are complex, large scale, multi-year infrastructure projects. And we often put a dollar value, sort of a minimum value of a billion dollars makes it a mega project. And they're everything from pipelines to subway lines to software systems. But despite their varied nature, different mega projects have an awful lot in common. And one of the things they have in common is they kind of share a dream of a frictionless society where massive infrastructure will connect and move information, people, goods smoothly, reliably, quickly, and they free us from the drag of geography. So about 20 years ago, uh, Bent Flifberg, Niels Brzezelis, and Werner Rottengatter surveyed more than a thousand major infrastructure projects from around the world. And when they looked closely, they found that this dream like faith that especially politicians have in these projects was completely misplaced. So despite the proliferation of these mega projects right till today, which is a lot of what the book is about, their outcomes are to put it mildly terrible. Projects are rarely completed on time. Cost runs aren't just uh, common, they're the norm, cost overruns, excuse me. And generally speaking, the bigger the project, the more likely it is to run late and go over budget. Half of mega projects exceed their budgets by more than 50%. And when you're thinking about the dollar values that are involved, it's a ton of money. But another um, sort of damning conclusion that they came to too is that the economic development that's promised, uh, you know, to kind of bloom in the wake of this infrastructure investment also does not materialize. Uh, even the Channel Tunnel, which is an example that Mariana mentions in her book, was actually a loss for its investors. And there was a very good study that basically demonstrated that the UK economy anyway would have been better off without it. So that something is not always better than nothing. So based on this research, Bent Flitberg says there is an iron law of mega, mega projects, that they are over budget, over time, and under benefits over and over again, that this is actually the norm, right, not the exception. And here, this is also where Mariana's questioning of putting too much weight on public-private distinctions is astute because the negative outcomes are found in both public and private projects and all different sort of constellations of public-private partnerships, which as she notes, are, are much older than you know, the last 20, 30, or 50 years. And even though, uh, these projects have taken their toll on the reputation of politicians and on those who perform professional analyses in support of them. Uh, they, they continue to proliferate and be very popular. We know that very well here in Toronto. But there's still been an erosion of trust that, as Mariana notes, has important consequences for democratic practices. In fact, Cliff Eric says that whether we like it or not, mega project development is currently a field where little can be trusted, not even, and some would say especially not, numbers produced by analysts, which is something that Mariana touches on again and again. So 
Even though Fliffjörg now teaches at the Said Business School at Oxford, he started out as a social political theorist interested in how we deploy rationality in the exercise of power. So he, like Mariana, is interested in why we like these projects, despite the near, near guarantee, guarantee that they fail or, or fail to deliver on their promises. Um, and some other level, right, they must be serving some kind of purpose. And I think that's some of what Mariana's work actually starts to answer. Um, as he has written just this month, the problem with project cost overruns and benefit shortfalls is not error, but bias. Estimates and decisions need to be de-biased, which is fundamentally different from eliminating error. In other words, it's politics, and especially as politics intersects with human behavior. So I would really love to see Mariana's insights on the politics of budgeting and law, uh, or the financial instruments, I should say, probably, and law brought into conversation with Fliffjörg's emphasis on bias and how we lie, and it is lying, not only to constituents, but he would say also to ourselves. Um, and then how all of this connects to how these projects are about conquering the tedious materialities of time and space, and then how these projects often solve that subsequently and not coincidentally, largely by enabling the wealthy to get a leg up on everyone else, whether it's high-speed rail or the humidity sensors that trigger sprinkler systems in parks that Mariana has written about. Um, and Mariana has a number of insights about how the solutions uh, might increase in inequality rather than mitigate it. And I think those observations are spot on and really only wanted more of them. And also as uh, now geographer, I think this book, although it's not explicitly geography, has a lot to offer the geographers who are still, I think, trying to kind of figure out what we call the social life of infrastructure. Infrastructure is suddenly, or what feels like suddenly, all over geography as well and social science these days, both as a noun and as an adjective. We now have infrastructural citizenship. Uh, I'm not sure I'm in love with the phrase, but the work is pretty smart. Um, you know, in the ways in which it creates not only place, but subjects. Um, you know, there's a lot of what Mariana um, admires as careful research that begins with people's lives, including their daily encounters with and needs for infrastructure. And Ashamin identified in 2014 what he saw as a new genre of thinking that narrates the social life of a city through its material infrastructure, which he believes creates an opportunity to reimagine the city as both a social and a technical arrangement. But I think a lot of geographic thinking here is actually quite limited and would benefit from engagement with work like Mariana's and with engagement with cultural theory and cultural studies and a lot of stuff in the humanities um, more broadly. Um, and so while it's not a geography book, I think it actually contributes quite a bit to that literature. I really like Mariana's attention to discourse woven into all of this, especially the work that images do the way they, they build, but also build upon our ideas and our hopes and our desires for some kind of ideal city, whatever that might mean. But for sure, it's cleaner, easier, faster, happier. Um, and I think that's um, embodied, as I want to mention again in a sec, um, in the chapter on high-speed rail, which she also identifies as sort of like, it's the paradigm of all of that, modernity, efficiency, speed, comfort, and now environmental awareness, which I want to come back to. And what we decide to build is connected to those larger dreams or visions and how we decide is key, right? As the, the city as a set of decisions, as Rob Kitchen said. And this question of democracy is really a central concern for Marianne, as you could tell from her presentation. She writes repeatedly of, quote, the sad state of democracy. And she writes of her concern that infrastructure planning that is democratic in substance as well as process is incompatible with the notion of signature product projects, which is the deals, right? What we get. Now, Flipberg says that part of the solution is better institutional practices. So not just better numbers, right? But extensive systems of accountability from the earliest stages, public transparency about costs and risks, and also the creation of political space to call a halt to a bad project. And I found it really interesting that Mariana cautions that transparency might not be what we wish it to be. And she disputes it at times whether it's even possible and that even if it were, it might not amount to, as she says, or even foster real accountability, much less democracy. And she notes in particular that existing practices are really 
thwarting it. She notes, for example, that audits are not being done by or for ordinary people. And she critiques public consultation as performances of consultation that are manipulated by rhetoric of project framing, strategic presentation of objective numbers, and beautiful imagery before the first question is even asked. And citizen participation is for sure a tricky question. Uh, at what scale does it happen? At what moments in the decision making? And thus to what degree and by what means? And Mariana rightly, I think, devotes an entire chapter to picking apart that process from research and from her own experience. Because infrastructure as a way of building cities is a deeply political or ideological in the way that Marx meant it, as she noted, um, uh, way of doing so, because it's working very, very hard to make it look like it has nothing to do with politics, even as it is serving very particular uh, classes, you know, that it has nothing to do with class politics, nothing to do with race politics, nothing to do with gender politics, which of course it always does, like quite explicitly even and intentionally in some instances. But that evasion requires a new vocabulary to talk about something without talking about it. And part of Mariana's method is to pay really careful attention to that vocabulary, to take it apart, to pay attention even to, as, as you can see from the beginning, you know, the terms that emerge, that appear to refer to something specific, but are so vague, as she says, to provide uh, all kinds of space for authorities to carry out all manner of diverse activities. And so she picks apart, I, I think this is a fairly comprehensive list, but just to give you an idea, infrastructure, audit, good governance, community, funding, especially when they mean financing, smart cities, solutions, innovation, and even better, the innovation factor, partnership, especially public-private partnerships, but also the constant reworking of public and private themselves, as well as the relationship between them, uh, urban operating system, citizenship, citizenship and citizen engagement, and value for money. And numbers, oh, the use of numbers, the governing work, as she says, that is being done by numbers or under the banner of numbers, because putting numbers on things is like the best thing you can do, right? Because numbers are objective, right? They are apparently the least political. And again and again, she writes about the symbolic power and the symbolic work that infrastructure is doing to make infrastructure look like it is natural and apolitical, but even more so, like it is smart and right and just and even moral, right? As she says on the opening page of the book, infrastructure is seen as an unalloyed good. And she notes throughout the book, the strong moral flavor of quote, the risk of being managed by, by means of audits and other rituals, which I think is also religious language, a verification. She talks about how audits cannot guarantee virtue she writes, it is important to be skeptical about the presumed links between digital sophistication on the one hand and civic virtue on the other. And she writes critically about the expectation that we have that law acts on the world from the outside and or above to regulate conflicts, punish crimes, and generally bring order to an unruly world. And there's also the language of mission, which I think has religious harmonics, which I think brings me back to her 1991 book, The Age of Light, Soap and Water. And what I see as Mariana's ongoing interest and insight into virtue and morality and the way in which they're deployed. The connections between enlightenment and literally sometimes cleanliness of hands and minds. Um, and as she noted in that work, framing things in this way also makes certain solutions seem possible, even simple and easy. And I like also the, the, the connections between public-private partnerships there or the the public, um, sorry, the private partnerships are with philanthropists and civil society organizations like churches and so on, working with the state, including police forces. Like there are, there's some interesting resonances. Sorry, that's a bit of a tangent. What I also note about this politics, especially this morality kind of politics, although it's not always called that, is the complicated place that it puts people who want to oppose any project, right? Because you, if you oppose pipelines or energy saving technology, like whether it's Environmentally, environmentally friendly or otherwise, you're against progress, you're against being smart. Uh, and we've seen that again and again here in Toronto as well. There's not a lot of room for nuance and occupying this kind of moral, righteous, enlightened position uh, often matters more in politics than the correctness of the details. And as Mariana points out, this serves to hide weakness in process and the ways in which we build cities in the interest of some at the expense of others. And I, I do think about this a lot as I study rail, and I think her example of high-speed rail 
as a paradigm is spot on because right now it's increasingly advanced as a smarter, you know, more sustainable alternative to flying. Um, Ocasio-Cortez no less said last June that rail is climate infrastructure. As seriously as we take climate is how serious we take high-speed rail. But rail is not an unqualified good. Rail infrastructure has an intensely political history, right? Deeply involved in the production of empires and states, in the dispossession of indigenous peoples, in the extraction of resources, the concentration of wealth in private rail monopolies, the transformation and often splintering of city space, and an increase in physical danger and violence, and very uneven economic development, the explicit creation of winners and losers. And this, I think, is at the core of Mariana's argument, that despite its presentation, infrastructure is not an unalloyed good. It is a set of decisions that are shaped by the formal and informal politics and law that govern how those decisions get made. Now, Mariana doesn't provide a clear path towards how to fix this, especially for local democracy. Her book's not a textbook or a manual, and I'm not sure there is a clear path anyway. Um, but this is still a really smart book that exposes and unpacks a lot of that process and asks a lot of critical questions that those of us who seek to build a more just city or build a city more justly uh, should keep in mind. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tricia. I'm not going to give... Uh, Mariana, a chance to reply just yet. I'm going to invite now Sergio to provide his comments and then we'll provide an opportunity for Mariana to respond to both discussants' comments. Uh, Sergio Montero is Associate Professor of Urban and Regional Planning and Development at the University of the Andes in Bogota, Colombia. His research is focused on the politics and governance of urban and regional planning, the global circulation of urban and regional policy knowledge, and institutional and territorial approaches to local economic development with an emphasis on Latin American cities and peripheral regions. More recently, he has been interested in the increasing judicialization of planning in Bogota. He holds a BA in economics from Universidad de Granada and a master and PhD in city and regional planning from the University of California, Berkeley. Now over to you, Sergio. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Lisa, for organizing this event. It's uh, very exciting to be here commenting Mariana's new book. I want to, first of all, congratulate Mariana on this book. Uh, Mariana is one of the most respected voices in law and society debates, but we are also very lucky that Mariana has become interested in urban issues for many years now because that's given us in urban studies a chance to learn more about um, what the social legal approaches can uh, bring to our debates. And I think this is especially true for me as I've become more interested in, in these issues in recent years and I've discovered uh, Mariana's work and it's been really uh, a really interesting way for me to get into more um, or get deeper into these, these debates that have been going on for a while now. So I think that uh, what I'm going to do today is try to, uh, uh, after reading Mariana's book, try to focus on what I found more interesting for contemporary debates in urban studies, uh, particularly in urban planning, but also um, in development studies, which was something that I wasn't expecting to find. But then after reading this book, I think that there's also some ideas that, that, that can, we can draw from that book. And also, I want to say that also Mariana is a very generous scholar with her time. And since I've been in Toronto this semester, we've been having this urban social legal working group, which has been great. And I feel like this event is sort of like part of our weekly meetings. We often meet for an informal beer after as we're gonna do today. So I was gonna say that if maybe of the attendees are in Toronto, they are welcome to come to our uh, informal beer at 6 p.m. Maybe Lisa can give more details later. <laughs> So anyway, uh, so thank you. Um, and this book, I really enjoyed reading it. As I said, it gave me a lot of ideas as I think about my research, but also about future research projects. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to highlight five uh, points that I think are that I found particularly interesting and that relate to recent debates in urban studies. Uh, and also will finish with some ideas that I think we, that Mariana's book is like an invitation to explore more. Uh, so the first thing or the first point I would like to highlight here is the how Mariana's book join other voices in uh, urban studies and regional studies that are uh, showing the sort of like the return of infrastructure planning, the sort of like, which is not that it never went away, but it, somehow it's become 
uh, more present now. It's become in uh, link with issues of development as well, so of regional development. And we have to remember, as Mariana clearly showed in her slides, that uh, the building of infrastructure, uh, things like dams, uh, like the famous Tennessee Valley Authority river basin uh, management schemes in the 40s, in the post-war years, were linked to the, uh, this, the beginnings of regional development, or regional development planning, the idea of, of how we plan regions. So I feel that that system, the Tennessee Valley Authority, that one that we looked at the his that we always say, you know, when we are reviewing the history of regional planning, is sort of now coming again, in, but reincarnated with new debates and new, new discourses. So the idea of moving from public works to, to infrastructure, I thought it was very interesting in Mariana's book. Uh, scholars, uh, Seth Schindler and Miguel Canai have talked about infrastructure-led development and how we are in a new round of development discourses in which infrastructure is becoming again uh, more central um, and so I think that, you know, this is a very interesting debate that is happening. And I think that Mariana can give us some uh, approaches that put the emphasis on, to, uh, on social legal approaches, that, which to me, I think, means uh, putting a lot of more emphasis on how, this con how infrastructure works in terms of governance and in terms of contracts. I feel like there's been a lot of uh, discourse about governance in urban studies in, in the last 20 years, but I think that the particular emphasis on contracts, on legal tools, that is something that, that neither planners or urban studies scholars have been um, studying so closely. And I think that Mariana gave us some tools to do that. So that's one point that I want to make. The second point is public-private partnerships. So that's been also a, a huge debate in, in urban studies for a long time. And I feel like we, at least for me, but but for many people also, oh, David Harvey's article from 1989, the, from managerialism to entrepreneurialism was sort of like a key issue in sort of making critical urban studies more interested in the role that public-private partnerships have increasingly in urban governance. But I also, I also think, well, in the terms of Global South literature, I can also recall uh, Faranak Mirafta article on public-private partnership, the Trojan horse of neoliberal development. But as we can see, a lot of sort of the critical studies about uh, public-private partnership in urban studies have been focused on sort of how the relationship between public-private partnership and neoliberalism. And sort of like an automatic sign that if a public-private partnership is coming, neoliberal is coming too. And I think that Mariana questions this idea and, and tell us that yes, public-private partnership is uh, an instrument of neoliberal development, but not everything that is called a public-private partnership is uh, following uh, or automatically results in neoliberal outcomes. And I think that's a very important call to sort of be more, uh, uh, put more attention into what is exactly behind a public-private partnership. Because as she shows in many, of the chapters, particularly in the chapter on public-private partnership, but I think that that PPPs is a sort of like a transversal theme that appears also in other um, chapters. So she shows that really when we talk about public-private partnership, we are really talking about an assemblage and archipelago almost of contracts, uh, and that is what we should pay attention to, uh, because it's never like one clear thing that's called public-private partnership, even if in the reports, in the press, it would sound like that, it's always more complicated than that. I'm putting attention to that and what that really means. I think it's one of the takeaways that I'm, uh, for me, of, of this book. I also, I think, related with this, I really like the importance that Mariana, uh, the point that Mariana makes about the importance of regulation, uh, public regulation, uh, and how that's different from public ownership, right? So in many times, uh, we should be uh, conscious about how, by bringing the public-private partnership, uh, we put a lot of attention to the privatization of something, of be it a service, be it uh, a particular building. But we should also put uh, more attention into what is the how the public can regulate uh, that result of that public-private partnership. So it's not just about the fact of the public partnership, but it's who's going to be regulating that afterwards, and that is a very important area of investigation. And I think that, that this book also uh, brings that to the forefront. 
Um, another point that I was going to make, uh, uh, Trisha already made it, and I think that's good because I think that that's we are seeing something uh, very interesting in this book, which is the relation with the whole mega projects and Ben Flyberg work on how these mega projects of infrastructure normally go into uh, expenses overruns. And I think that ever, I mean, this is something that I've always uh, wonder myself why we're not questioning this more um, because this is something that we you know the way that it normally works is that some company wins a bit for a cheap for for uh, a commitment to build an infrastructure project and then suddenly some years after it's like oh you know what this is going to cost 50 percent more or 70 percent more and you don't see instances of people protesting this and it's such a waste of resources and public money. So I think that again, Mariana's book uh, bring us to these deba debates. And as Patricia said, uh, this is also about politics. It's about politics, not just about when we're about to sign the contract. It's also about how the contract evolves and turns into something else and still consuming public resources way after it was signed. So I think that, um, I think Mariana's work can also help us uh, in hopefully inspire some uh, scholars to put more attention to this and the role again of contracts, of courts, of legal mechanisms to, to hold companies accountable of that because this is really a waste of public resources. Uh, and this brings me to the next point that I wanna make, which is, that there is a politics of infrastructure. And I feel that there, this is also a debate that has been happening in urban studies for a while. The idea that, that was brought by Eric Singedo on the idea of post-politics, right? The idea that we are many times now discussing uh, policies, not politics. But also in recent years, some um, critical scholars have said, well, there is also a politics in things that look uh, things that look well like community consultation, things like look like policy, not politics, things like things and events that seem not to be political, but that has to be domesticated in a way by planners. But there's still a way of politicizing those space. There's still a way of politicizing those decisions. So I think that um, there's much that we need to uh, learn and put attention to how infrastructural decisions are made because there seems to be emerging a way in which uh, people are protesting this. In my own research in Bogota, what I've seen is that people are increasingly going to the judges, to the courts, to stop big infrastructure projects. So one of the examples now is the new uh, Bogota Transmilenio BRT line that was stopped by a judge after some citizen put a class actions against it. So, so what we're gonna, so this is an instance of a new urban politics. So, how can we then study this as part of, of urban politics and, and as part of the failure of other participatory planning means? I think this is something that resonates a lot with my current research, but I am sure that it will be useful for other scholars interested in urban politics, in thinking about participation in cities beyond the consultation meeting. So how, how are we going to participate in shaping contracts and in shaping uh, the politics of infrastructure. Um, the other point that I want to make uh, here is, is that I saw different mentions to the World Bank across Mariana's book. And I found it very interesting. And that's where I will make the point to maybe more development studies, which is another field that I am interested in. And I think that what Mariana's uh, work can do there is to really help us imagine the new ways in which the World Bank is influencing decisions in especially in the cities uh, and countries of the global south, um, not just by lending money, not just by being the infrastructure expert, the technical experts, but also being the legal experts uh, of how, uh, how infrastructure projects should be contracted and how they should be structured. And these made me think again in my research, in my own research in Bogota, and how this metro, uh, the first metro line of, of Bogota was just um, signed a couple uh, last year. And 
it was interesting because as much as there was a lot of protest and legal action against BRT, somehow the Metro line, which was way bigger contract, uh, and some people were not also happy about how parts of it was going to be elevated as opposed to um, uh, uh, subway. Uh, So because of the difficulties of the contract and because the contract was done following a World Bank and an Inter-American Development Bank protocol, that made that contract somehow blinded from both local judges and also citizens because they really didn't understand how to complain about this contract. So that made me think about how we need to put more attention to the ways in which the World Bank and international development organizations uh, are also intersecting with how contracts are made and how they can act as blinding contracts from uh, judges, from local or national judges, which is what happened in, in Colombia. So I think that there's an, there's an interesting way or, or avenue to do research about this, this role of the World Bank, which we haven't seen so much. The, the World Bank, we've seen the World Bank as, as like the critique of borrowing money, the critique of the, the knowledge bank. But I think that we are yet to understand what's the role of the World Bank and international development organizations with legal expertise. Um, so, um, and so finally, I will end with some of the things that I saw in the book, but I think that maybe we could explore more and maybe uh, with all, maybe Mariana will explore it more in the future or other researchers would also like to explore. One is the issue of infrastructure repair and maintenance. I think that this is a big debate also in urban studies and, I, and Mariana touches on it uh, and, and refers the work of uh, Idalina Baptista in, in Mozambique. And I think this is a very important uh, issue. And we recently saw the collapse of the Mexico City, uh, a, a breach of the, of the Mexico City Metro line, which killed many people. So it's not, so we need to pay more attention to the maintenance of infrastructure and how that is also regulated by particular contracts. And those contracts are, if, if we normally don't look at contracts of infrastructure or the details, we definitely don't look at what's gonna happen after the years. And that is re- very important because normally we are, uh, we are talking also about a lot of public resources. And so how we understand that and analyze that and critique that is very important. And I don't see many scholars doing it, although I feel like the debate is becoming uh, uh, more important now. Um, I think that something that I also, Mariana mentioned, and she mentioned it again now, which is the role of big infrastructure uh, companies in pushing governments to build. Like, how can we understand those global politics? Because as she said, in Spain is very clear too, like in Spain, part of the, I mean, this is obviously uh, (laughs) a hypothesis, but I feel like part of the reason why Spain has built so much highways and so much uh, highway, uh, high-speed rail in last years is because there's these, there are like two or three really big companies that have been pushing and pushing and pushing the national government to move public resources to their business. And I think they're starting to do that at the global level. So how can we understand these global spaces where big infrastructure companies get together with big financing funds to push for particular infrastructure projects? So I think that's a very interesting area uh, that's uh, intersect with obviously with all the discussions that are happening with the financialization of infrastructure. And I think it's a very interesting topic uh, to study more. The other thing that I would say that I would have loved to hear more is the role, and it, this came more evident for me in the audit uh, chapter where Mariana talks about the travels of audit culture and audit mechanisms. And I think that there, if we could connect that with the rich literature on policy mobilities and transfer, there's a lot of tools there that can help us understand how these legal mechanisms are moving around and what are the power relations that are behind those and what are the institutions that are behind that. And I think what I like about the policy mobilities approaches is that in a way they allow us to think about these global actors and these global dynamics that are happening even if we're studying the movement of particular tools or particular policies from one city to another, but in the way that of studying 
mobility is, I think, what is interesting at this point is that it allows us to think about global processes. So I think that's that could be an interesting avenue of, of engaging uh, Mariana's research with the policy mobilities. And finally, and that's my, my last comment, but uh, finally, methods. I think that uh, methods are, for me, uh, maybe the big absent in Mariana's book. I mean, a, dis a particular discussion about methods, especially because after reading the book, I was like, I want to do this. And I know that Mariana is not a lawyer, which made me even more eager to think that I can use uh, the analysis of legal tools not being a lawyer, because that's maybe the, the big um, obstacle that many urban scholars have had in engaging more seriously with, with the details of contracts, with the details of uh, arrangements, with the, the details of legal tools, because some, somehow, as much as sometimes we're scared about quantitative uh, numbers and indicators, we're also scared about with the language of the law. So I think that uh, it will be interesting to, for Mariana to, to reflect on how, how do we, because how, how do we an analyze legal documents, legal uh, judicial decisions, contracts, things like that? What, how can we do that uh, in a, for, especially for non-lawyers or people that have not been trained in, in the law? So I think that that is something that I'd love to hear Mariana's thoughts about it. Um, because I think that could be maybe one of the biggest obstacles of people engaging more seriously with, with these tools that, uh, that Mariana's book, so Mar that Mariana's book highlights. Uh, and so how we do, how do we do it? It's a, it's a, uh, it's the question that I, after find, uh, reading that book, I was left with, I want, I think this book is great. Then how, how do we do something similar? Um, thank you. Thank you, Sergio, so much for your comments. Now I would like to invite Mariana to provide a response to our discussions. So I'll be really quick on Sergio's last point. I can tell you that I know many law professors. None of them were willing to even look at infrastructure Ontario contracts with me or for me. So, because they said, oh no, those are, you know, very specialized. And then I discovered in my research that those contracts are written by the most junior lawyer in the firm because they're cut and paste. Um, so the questions that people like you and I would ask of, how the World Bank is imposing norms. Those are not lawyers' questions. So we shouldn't be intimidated. I mean, for a long time, I mean, I'm, I mean, there's times when you need to talk to lawyer friends. And in Los Andes, you have plenty of law professors who could answer your questions on administrative law or something. I mean, there are times when you need to ask a sort of more technical question and get help. But most of the questions we ask are not lawyers' questions. And so we need to go where no lawyer has trod before or whatever the phrase is. Um, anyway, that's maybe for another time. But I, I do wanna say one thing about the whole idea of mega projects. I don't like that term. And I like Flyberg's work a great deal. I think he's one of the best people writing on infrastructure, but I don't like the word mega projects because it seems to assume a kind of Jane Jacobs, small is beautiful. We don't, we shouldn't do anything too expensive or too, too, too ambitious. And what happens is that the wrong people are choosing the mega projects, but in Canada, the most dire infrastructure needs would take a huge budget and are very geographically expensive as all, all you know the Canadians here know. Internet access, like fast and cheap internet access in rural areas and in the north is a dire infrastructure need that would need, if, I mean, you don't have to call it a mega project, but certainly a huge, and it would have to be publicly funded because it's not bankable. Uh, 
you know, Rogers and Bell are not doing this because they can't make any money out of it. Um, so um, I think we shouldn't be thinking so much about size of projects. Uh, we should be thinking more about whose interests they serve and who planned them and, you know, whether the high speed rail in the UK is bad because it was the Boris Johnson vanity project and it was his sort of way to deal with Brexit without dealing with Brexit. So, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why it was wrong, but high speed rail in the UK is not in and of itself a bad idea. Um, you know, those of us who've been in the UK in recent years know that we could use some of those Spanish high speed, um, you know, trains, maybe some places. Um, anyway, um, I just think it's dangerous to talk about size as sort of in and of itself, good or bad. And I don't think that's what the mega project, you know, sort of critics do, but they, it, it's easy to kind of misread it and say anything really big and ambitious is wrong because it's going to go over budget. Well, of course it's going to go over budget, but you know, pothole repairs in the city of Toronto always go over budget too. And that's not necessarily a problem in and of itself. The problem is the overall, you know, proportion of public funds that are going to potholes as opposed to the police, right? So, I mean, size in general is not, not a question, but what, what I think speaks to the same issues that the critics of mega projects are interested in, but from a different perspective, is the kind of thing that a lot of African scholars, especially like African urbanists are developing, which is a critique of what they call the infrastructure ideal, which is the Eurocentric ideal, which is, you know, Trisha, I think what you were talking about, the idea of some frictionless, totally expansive, fabulous, smooth system that will never go wrong and, you know, will never have a power outage or, you know, whatever. Uh, so the critique of the Eurocentric infrastructure ideal, I, I think, gets at many of the same things, but from a different perspective. And so in a recent special issue of, Ur of Urban Studies, I think edited by Colin McFarland, um, who does a lot of really good work on, on African cities, you know, there was a whole lot of good, good discussions and good examples. One of the articles was on the right to P sort of movement in Mumbai and, you know, providing toilets, especially for women, so that women can go out in public and do things or go to work because they will be able to use a toilet. The right to pee sort of movement is probably not what most people thought of as a mega project. But if you were to provide toilets in all Indian cities, you know, sufficient for the population, it would be a sort of mega project that would be big and expensive. Uh, maybe not really expensive because it's not that expensive to build, uh, you know, sort of a, like a simple sort of toilet. But um, anyway, that's what I think is interesting is to look at what's going on in certain places in the global south, especially in Africa and parts of India, uh, and learn from that because those experiments are seen as experiments and are seen as just for the global south. But really, you know, we could make do with a lot of those things here. Uh, there would be a lot of needs that the city of Toronto has, which could be met in ways that are different than the sort of classic infrastructure ideal. Um, so, I mean, there are, you know, people out there Abdul Malik Simon and there's other people who are doing really good work and in sort of critical urban studies who I think draw our attention to other ways of doing things. Um, and I think in Canada, we don't have very much of that, but we could have more, especially 
involving indigenous communities, which are the ones that have dire infrastructure needs that are not going to be met by the private sector. Anyway, so I'll, I'll stop there because we do have all kinds of people uh, who have been faithfully watching. Thank you, Mariana. So before starting the Q&A, just because I organized this event, I'm gonna start with the first question. My question is actually on your chapter on consultation. I was very interested in a, the, the amount of detail you provide as to how in every single goal of a potential public engagement, a, all these instances tend to be very performative. Um, so my question is, how can uh, citizens actually uh, find more transparency when confronted with these uh, mega projects? He said, because in the context of Colombia, for example, as Sergio mentioned, we are increasingly seeing litigation as a way to participate for citizens. Um, so I'm wondering for, for the Canadian context, what if any is, is an alternative uh, and I was also very interested in the way you talked about the data mining by sidewalk labs through the, the, the um, yeah. sticky, yeah, like how uh, people thought that by using the sticky notes, they were participating, but actually that was a, an exercise in data mining. So yeah, so I, I'm just interested if you can talk a little bit more about that. And ultimately, what can residents do to, uh, to contest these huge infrastructure projects or at least seek for more transparency? Um, well, I don't think we should be asking for more transparency. I think we need to develop, and this is where you know those of you who teach planners maybe could help you know, develop different ways of doing consultations. I wrote a short article for the uh, Urban Studies Anthology edited by John Lawrence and somebody else called Subdivided. And there I contrasted the official city consultation on Queen Street in Leslieville, where I live, with a parallel consultation done by a community group that actually went to consult people where they live. So like uh, women's shelter, uh, health center serving you know, Chinese seniors, the kind of people who would never show up because we all know, right? Like if the city calls a consultation about a development, the kind of people who show up are the, you know, the, the uh, people that I always call the retired school teacher demographic. Um, and any young person under the age of 30 who's there is almost for sure a planning student. Uh, you know, they're not there because they are, they feel that they can participate in, in the neighborhood. So there's other ways of, you know, soliciting input that don't, that are not just, oh, call a public meeting because that's a statutory, re you know, requirement or put your contracts online because that's a transparency you know, requirement. I, I think planners need to work very differently um, uh, and really try to change this. Now, of course, in Ontario, we have the problem that anytime a city does anything interesting and innovative, the province you know, shuts it down. So, you know, but other cities in other parts of the world have more autonomy and have developed other ways of engaging citizens. And you need to engage them before you decide what to do. I mean, if you just present them with a picture, oh, this is gonna be the, the uh, building and now you get to decide whether the top floor is gonna be painted blue or green. Well, okay. So there needs to be a kind of you know participatory budgeting kind of process that happens with infrastructure. And we need to hear from the groups that have the serious infrastructure needs. And now we're not hearing from them. And those groups are tenants, young people, immigrants, and so on. Uh, so, you know, it's, uh, I, I don't think you can detach the consultation process from our general lack of democracy. Which is why I don't offer any solutions. Right. 
Thank you. And just by the way, those students, like I tend to assign my students that exact exercise to go and observe to consultations, compare, analyze. So yeah. Yeah. And okay. they're always the one, you know, there's like two people under 30 in the room and they're planning students. For sure. Okay. So we have a really interesting question here. Are you aware of what, if any, role private and or public pension funds play in flowing workers' money into these infrastructure projects? Um, well, I am to some extent because the, the uh, teachers, you know, pension fund, the Ontario Teachers Pension Fund, which is huge, um, whose real estate arm is Cadillac Fairview, and a lot of people don't even know that. I bet you a lot of teachers in Ontario don't realize their pension fund owns Cadillac Fairview and therefore owns all these malls and other places. So I think what needs to happen is for, for public sector workers to start to demand, and, and, and you know, this is a place you know, where, where you know, perhaps transparency can have real meaning. Um, uh, so OMERS, which is the other big sort of public sector pension fund that is in Ontario, has a real estate arm that is called Oxford Properties. Well, I'm sure these names are chosen because they sound like just any corporation, right? And so workers and retirees need to really start you know, bugging the representatives that they have on these pension funds, because um, up until now, the pension funds have been dominated by people from the finance sector. And even if you have a union representative on the pension fund, that union representative will have their brain washed completely in the training session by somebody who comes from finance and who says, how can we make the most money for our retirees. And of course, if infrastructure is not private, it can't be invested in, right? <laughs> so if OMERS is going to invest in something, it has to be privatized in the first place, which is why OMERS and teachers own, you know, privatized airports in Europe. In Canada, we don't have, you know, completely privatized airports, so they can't own them. So there's definitely a lot that could be done to make the operation of the pension funds, especially the real estate arms and their infrastructure arms, more transparent to current workers and retirees, because they're the ones who could put pressure. Thank you, Mariana. We have another question from the audience here uh, about the, the redacted, part of the financials, the redacted of so-called transparent contracts. Uh, so our audience partic our participant is asking, what is in the rest of the 600 pages? Since lawyers are so good at hiding oh, stuff. Yeah. Well, it. it's, it's all stuff about remote events that may or may not happen. So who will be responsible for weather delays or who will do this or when will such a thing be delivered, you know? So it's all the details about who bears what risks. And of course, many of those risks will never come to pass, uh, which is why these contracts are very profitable because it's true the private sector assumes a lot or in some cases, even all the risks of, of the contract. But if those risks never come to pass because you never have, you know, a COVID emergency, which was the case until, you know, recently, or you don't encounter a lot of underground water or you have various other things that are in the contract as things that could happen, all these possible risks, who's going to bear responsibility for them? Well, a lot of these risks do not come to pass. And sometimes they do, as happened with the Eglinton LRT. Uh, since they found all this water under the, the Heglinton station. And then it was like, oh my God, what are we going to do? And then, he, he, and then you had the consortium 
that is doing the LRT, suing, um, you know, Metrolinx and failing miserably <laughs> to uh, sort of, you know, make any changes. Anyway, um, it's, what is redacted is always what is most important. In many of the freedom of information requests that I have seen and that I saw, especially around the Google city waterfront Toronto thing, somebody did a request, an access to information um, you know, request to the federal government for all emails from the prime minister's office to the ministry of infrastructure to waterfront Toronto. And what was most often redacted was who sent the email, was the address, <laughs> which would have been the most interesting thing to know because you want to know if it's Justin Trudeau's, you know, chief of staff who's sending the email or not. So um, uh, what is redacted is always, you know, what is most important, but it's not always the numbers and, you know, the, the uh, financials. Um, uh, especially since, as this insider told me, there's the contract and then there's the post-contract contingency fee, which is not posted anywhere and it's not public and it's not discussed. And I bet you even the Minister of Transportation doesn't know that it exists. Thank you, Mariana. There is a question about a new trends in the funding of infrastructure that we should be paying attention to. For example, the use of infrastructure to gather data on usage, on usage that can be sold to pay for to pay off infrastructure debt. That's an interesting question. Yeah, um, that sort of merges with the smart city um, stuff. Um, and recently the city of Toronto signed a terrible, terrible contract with a digital payments company that says, oh, it'll be so smooth and frictionless. You know, you can pay your municipal taxes online. Well, that's fine. But after you've done that, they're also going to say, and while you're at it, you can pay your parking fines online and you can pay for all of these other things online. Well, you can imagine the troves of data about people, the property they own, the car they own, their car license plate, you know, like all kinds of data. And there was no assurance that that data would be given to the city and not sold or shared by the private company. And even if the, the uh, you know, private US company that got the contract were to share the data with the city, I mean, it's easy to share data. I can send you a copy of my CV and it's still in my, in, in my computer, right? So even if they share the data with, with the city, the city probably has a policy to not sell data to the you know, private sector, but the private company in Kansas does not have you know, such a policy. Um, and they can do whatever with the, the uh, data. And that data is probably more valuable than whatever profit they make on, on you know, the digital payments. Okay, we have one more question. What is your opinion of Canada's national infrastructure assessment? Is it a useful exercise? Um, I'm not sure sort of how that, is going. Um, it's bound, I mean, I can make a prediction that it's going to be a failure. The reason being that the federal government has very little jurisdiction over any infrastructure. I mean, they used to have Air Canada and CN and, you know, some other kind of national infrastructures of major scale. But now they have the St. Lawrence Seaway, the Trent Canal, and a lot of small ports and harbors and airports in parts of the country where running those sort of for profit would not make sense. So the federal government really has 
very little role in infrastructure. And that is a feature of our particular federalism. In other countries, it's very different. So it's almost impossible to do a national project in infrastructure. Um, so, I mean, the vast majority of infrastructure in Canada is owned by municipalities, owned and operated by municipalities. All those long roads, you know, in sort of rural Canada, they're all owned by the township or the county or the city. Um, and that's, that's the majority of infrastructure. Uh, and then provinces have um, energy, hydroelectricity, and you know, so on. But the feds have nearly nothing. So, uh, I mean, they have some, some sort of remnants, but they sold the only things that were really worth it, which were Air Canada and CN. I think, I mean, I haven't done research on this. Thank you, Mariana. <clears throat> uh, I'm gonna invite Patricia, Patricia and Sergio if they want to comment at this point or ask a question. Okay, Patricia. Um, yeah, there, there are a number of things I'm looking forward to chatting further this evening as well. Um, I wanted to circle back to the public consultation stuff because I thought you did a really good job of taking that apart. Um, and I agree the experience in Toronto is really, really limited in terms of our consultation practices or well, they vary, um, but on some questions they're, they're embarrassingly bad. But what's interesting is that the people who are responsible for public consultation um, would if they had the ability do it differently. And there are folks who do this work in other Canadian cities, even just as far as Burlington, who do it a whole lot better. They have entire offices dedicated to it, but also that they have charters um, that bind council decisions, you know, that force them engage, to engage not only in consultation, but exactly in the kind of practices um, that you've talked about. Like I'm thinking about, for example, Calgary, which has tried to do um, advanced discussions on the budget before that budget process even starts. And they also, like you said, like go out to the community instead of, well, there's one public meeting and it's at city hall and it's at dinner time and, you know, good luck getting a babysitter kind of thing. Right. Um, and go into a diversity of communities at different times and, you know, meet people where they are. Um, but also, as I said, have, have rules that, that say you have to, you have to do a certain kind and you have to measure it and you have to present that and it has to kind of be, you know, approved before you can go to the next step. Do you think something like that is feasible in Toronto? Because I also think it isn't just that Toronto refuses to learn from any other city, although there's that. But I think there are reasons that public consultation looks the way it does, right? Well, like I, I think it's partly a choice yeah. too, so. And a lot of it is the weight of, you know, the development industry in Toronto politics and City Hall in particular, I mean, the developers basically run the city, but they're not very visible, but they do run the city. I mean, ever since, who was it? James Lorimer wrote that book in the seventies about you know, the developers and it hasn't changed. I mean, we all know who pays most of the expenses for the right-wing city councillors, you know, who get re-elected over and over again. So that's a big factor. And it is true that many of the planners who do work at City Hall wish they could do other things because when I was interviewing planners, the refrain that I heard over and over again is, we don't plan, we just process development applications. And so they would like to do something. And, you know, many of them have, you know, good ideas, progressive ideas. They just can't implement them. But as well, there should be some sort of association of, I mean, I think the Federation of Canadian Municipalities could do a lot to sort of share best practices and all of this kind of thing, because we do need a method for 
the sort of policy mobility that Sergio was talking about. And I think a federation of municipalities is what is needed, although the federation of municipalities would have to begin by including First Nations and you know reserves, uh, which it does not include at, at this point. And that's a big thing because many of the infrastructure needs on reserves could be easily met if the if the municipality that it is closest were to share its drinking water or its sewers. Um, but they don't do it because they say, oh well, you know, First Nations are federal jurisdiction and we don't have anything to do with it. And why should we bother? So I mean. There's a sort of fundamental political problem about transmunicipal sort of collaboration. Um, and I'm in no position to, you know, recommend anything, but I can see the defects and the result of the fact that we don't have that. I had to actually go to Victoria some years ago to find out that they use something that's very similar to section 37, but they use it in a much more rational manner and not just the local city councilor sort of giving out, oh, a daycare center if it's Olivia Chow and a little bit of parkland if it's a suburban councilor. So I only learned that by actually going to Victoria, which is a little ridiculous. So transmunicipal you know, collaboration on policy and governance I don't see that happening very much. Thank you, Mariana. Sergio, you, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Um, yeah, no, I want to, I mean, this is a fascinating um, conversation about how we change these consultation meetings that we all know that they're not working. I mean, this has been a debate, like an endless debate in planning. Uh, and we all know that it's not working. And I think that it's not a matter of just changing the methodology. So because sometimes I feel like the, this discussion is framed as like, oh, the public meeting is not working. Let's try to find another methodology where more people can attend, where you know more voices can be heard. But I don't think, I think that that's, to me at least, is a dead end. I don't think this is a question about methodology. I think this is a question of rethinking what is planning. And I think that this has to do with, uh, you know, acknowledging that planning is politics and, and, that, and that many of the decisions about projects and planning are discussed and blocked or approved by council uh, members. I think that's, I mean, at least that's the case uh, in Bogota where there's like at least some significant discussions, uh, discussion about so what is going to be approved or not it does is not, it does not happen in the consultation with neighbors right it does but it does happen in the council when these are when the council members sometimes are also so like what is happening at least in the case that i know the best which is bogota is that citizens are as lisa said they're litigating but they're also going directly with council members that they think that are more approximate to their ideas. And so they go to them, they try to mobilize people to show that there's support. Then council, for council members, it's politically you know, a benefit because they're like people that are angry about a project. So, so I think there's a lot of politics that is happening through uh, politics, <laughs> through council members and negotiations with mayor. And I think that planners cannot just be these people that are at the end of this process, you know, organizing a meeting, showing a PowerPoint. Like that is really lame. <laughs> and that planning profession cannot uh, be uh, relegated to that. And I think that we have this, this tradition from the 60s of advocacy planning, for instance, where planners really were representatives of particular populations, especially vulnerable populations. And they did all they had to do in order for the projects to, to happen, right? So this, so in a way, it's about reframing the role of planning to make to these people that are making sure that socially just projects will happen, will be implemented. Uh, and yes, there will be consultations, but it's not, I'm more and more, I'm convinced that it's not in the consultation part where projects will become better. 
it, it, this all this discussion happens be, way before and so we need to be way before making the discussion and the planners also should be there in sharing and trying to mobilize people to be participants of that discussion and then sometimes when people are not participants then channeling a particular vision uh, of of the public or of social justice or whatever but not just when the project has been already yeah. decided no and it's the same here you know Sergio I mean when I started going to meetings of the planning and growth committee of council as it was called and I was struck by the fact that the councillors spend more time going into the audience and picking out their favorite constituents and hugging them and so on and hearing you know what sort of what they wanted said and so politics was being done in that room uh, and certainly the councillors know who shows up to vote for them so uh, but that still doesn't deal with the question that I raised about the one project at a time scale because in my neighborhood which has a progressive counselor you 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 know there's often support for a shelter or a new public housing project or something in a way that in another um you know neighborhood there would not be but you know if the counselor says oh we're going to build you know a 20 bed shelter at the bottom of pape avenue or something well that's fine. I'm in favor of that because I want more shelters, but maybe we should be building a 200 bed shelter in Rosedale or something, you know. Um, and so one project at a time is not the best scale. And what we don't have in infrastructure these days is evidence based needs assessments like in healthcare, they will do a needs assessment and see, okay, how many people with diabetes live in this kind of area or, or you know, something. But with infrastructure, it's like, do you like this project or not? Well, I don't know. You know, people will like what they like. Um, and I will say, yes, more shelters and more affordable housing. And the right wing people will say no. Uh, but you know, a needs assessment that is region wide, not just city wide, would be quite something. Now, I have no idea if the feds had anything of the sort in mind. In any case, the feds would not be the ones to sort of carry that out. They just don't have the jurisdiction and the provinces would all scream at them and the feds would run back to Ottawa. So you know, who, who who knows, but the needs assessments are what we don't have at all. Anyway, that's my one sort of social science point. Okay, well, thank you so, so much. Big thank you, Mariana, for sharing your uh, book, your ideas, congratulations on this amazing book. Um, and thank you, uh, Tricia, Sergio, for being discussant. Thank you to all the participants and also to Alex Felipe, who's helping us with the run the webinar and help us with all the, the technical aspects of it. Thank you. Stay tuned for other events of our CVs Research Cluster. <laughs>